right, here we go. Let's find a place. We'll get started. Here we go. Daylight's burning. All right, good morning. Welcome to Simple Truth Church. It's great to be here this morning. Looking forward to it all week to be back here and see you guys. And it was, I hope you had a good week. Crazy week in the world, but God's still in control. God's always in control. I'm glad He's God and we're not. So, uh, got a, a few announcements today. But one, I guess my biggest announcement is Olivia Ann Alloways. Yeah. Woohoo! Wow. She was uh, 20 pounds, 5 ounces. Actually, she was 7 pounds, 9 ounces, and 20 and a half inches long. And she's, uh, she's still in the hospital. She was taken into the NIC unit for uh, really, really bubin? <laughs> Billy Rubin. That's what happens when you smoke dope when you're a kid. You, you say things backwards. But anyway, <laughs> Billy Rubin. And uh, it jumped, it said, the doctor said to it, an untreatable level, almost. That's kind of, I don't understand that. The nurse understands it, but they put her in the little incubator with the lights, and mama's been going in every three hours to nurse her, and they're trading off with daddy, and she's a happy baby. They send pictures, and she's smiling, and, and uh, she's very happy. And she has blue eyes, and she's very, uh, she's a trained observer al already. She, she's just like very vigilant, checking out, see what's going on. And uh, like, what am I doing out here? And uh, absolutely gorgeous. Anyway, thank you for your prayers. And then Karen Kinney was telling me that this week she became a great grandmother. Wow. Wow. Amazing. I said, well, man, your son's only like 18. She says, he's 48. No way. Man, it seems like I arrested him yesterday. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Well, anyway, congratulations. Great grandmother. So my, my granddaughter is my, my mother's great, great granddaughter. So, but that's her, I think, third great, great grand, grandbaby. So that's exciting. Anyway. And then... Uh, Prayer request, remember you can go online at simpletruthlive.com and you can check things out and, and uh, you can go on there via our website and look at our cell phones, whatever, contact us. You can fill out prayer requests for them back there, at the, stick them in the agape box and we'll make sure we get those prayer requests on the prayer line. And uh, again, you can contact us anytime on our cell phones. And then you can visit our website, links provided to uh, access... Uh, to our Facebook page and also services on YouTube. So they go live right now on Facebook and then Larry posts them later on, uh, on YouTube. And then uh, we, this, you know, there's been a lot of things that, you know, I've told you that social distancing is kind of cool in a lot of respects. And uh, one of the things is, is, is we're getting out of that corner office. We've decided after all this happened, it's like we pay rent on that office and we don't use it and we can, we can whittle it down to we're, we're looking at some other offices over here when that holiday market leaves. We got calls and stuff into him. Maybe we can have our church and office in the same place, which would be nice. But in the meantime, this is our last month at the church office. So by July 1st, we're going to be out of the church office. And, and in the meantime, if we don't have a place, we'll figure out. We'll be nomadic and, and figure out where we can do Bible studies. But for the most part, uh, we don't need that place out there on Front Street. And, and the, the landlords, are uh, they don't care about that building because it's going to be torn down. And so anything that we have to do to that building costs money. And, and, and then we have to keep it up and 
all that stuff that goes along with it all it costs time and money. And so we just realized during this whole COVID thing that, hey, you know what? We could probably get by without that. And so we're going to let that go. And uh, we're going to be praying about figuring out where we're going to land and, and uh, so we could have a place called home for Bible studies and such. But for right now, we're, uh, we have this month to uh, work on that. And so then uh, women's, that I say that to say this, you know, that, that women's Tuesday morning prayer, uh, Zoom meetings are at 9.30, and you can contact Susie Sagan if you want to join the Zoom meetings. Uh, men have been meeting out, uh, at the church office on Friday mornings, and they'll continue to do that this month. And then uh, women's Bible studies, they're going to meet throughout the, the summer, and they're also on Zoom. And so you can get a hold of, of uh, Jan Hagel, Lori, either one of them, and, and uh, get involved in that as well. And then evening group uh, meets Wednesday via Zoom, and you can contact Marianne Mason. All right. And then, uh, let's see, on, online church directory, if you want to be a part of that, you can get, get a hold of Jan Hagel. And um, our prayer is uh, continue to pray for our granddaughter, please. And then uh, Jeff Ellis said thank you very much for praying for his father. Right after uh, we prayed for him, his father got out of the hospital. And so uh, we'll continue to pray for him. He, uh, he says he might have cancer. We'll pray he doesn't. We continue to pray for uh, Tom Kristoff and Nancy Berger, Sarah Fink, Josiah Thornton, Dave McGurr, Chris Como, and then uh, for our uh, pray for our law enforcement and obviously our country, and and then also pray for our service members who are attached to our church somehow. And uh, Corey Pierce, that would be uh, the first guy up. He was just deployed to Assyria two days ago. He's a, he's a first sergeant in the Army, 82nd Airborne Ranger. And he is Farina's stepson. So he's uh, Chris Farina's wife, Nikki's son. So we'll pray for him. And uh, looks like a, a great guy. And then we'll continue to pray. You can keep him rolling. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any updates on any of these you can sing out, but uh, it is an honor to be able to keep them in prayer and pray that God would keep them safe, keep them well, and um, I was thinking about the riots in Seattle, I was looking at pictures and they had the uh, National Guard out there that were lined up behind the cops, and I'm thinking those National Guard for the most part are kids that never thought that they'd have to go up against their peers and, uh, and they probably went into the National Guard to uh, have a better chance at schooling and serve their country at the same time. And so it's, it's, that's a bummer. So we'll pray for them as well. Bless you. Don't be sneezing in here. and our first responders. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're, uh, we are thankful that you're God and that you're sovereign and that you're in control, that nothing that's going on in this world is shocking to you, that it's unfolding exactly like you know it would and will. And so we're thankful that you're in control, that we can look to you and, and for our peace. And, and so, Lord, we pray that. Lord, we pray that there would be peace, Lord, that there would be peace, that people would come to know you, and that's the way there's going to be peace, that people would, would want peace and long for search, and then they would seek, and then they would find you. And so we pray that, that people would come to know Jesus, and that they would be changed from the inside out. We pray that, Lord. We pray for our country. We pray for our, our, uh, our commanders, Lord the people that are in charge, we pray that you would give them wisdom. We pray that you would keep them safe. Lord, um, we pray that they would figure it out too. We pray there'd be some humility and we lift them up to you. Lord, we pray for our service members and, and those that are uh, 
serving our country. We just pray that you would bless them and, and keep them safe, keep them well. Lord, as they're deployed all over the world and, and um, craziness from all directions, Lord, we pray that you would keep them vigilant, but you would also give them peace. And Lord, that you would give comfort to their families. Lord, we pray for those that are sick among us. And we know you're the great physician. We know that. We know that, that you're, the Bible says, your word says, you're the God of all comfort. You're the God of all peace. And so we pray that, that for those that are sick among us, Lord, you draw them closer to you than they've ever been, that, they're, that, that their walk and their, their, uh, just the, the security they feel on who they are in you, Lord, that you would give them that peace that passes understanding. Lord, that they know, that they know, that they know that you're in control in, in, in their life and that you could reach down inside of them and you could just fix whatever needs to be fixed. Lord, I thank you for Olivia Ann and, and just, uh, she's gorgeous. And I thank you for that gift for my son and daughter-in-law and for us and just pray that, that today she'll be able to get out of the hospital because she's healed. And so we lift her up to you and, and Lord, we're just thankful. We're thankful again that we can come here as a family. We look around us, see brothers and sisters, and just uh, pray that you would keep this family well. Lord, that you would uh, continue to give us direction, give us peace, give us discernment. And Lord, we uh, thank you. Pray that we could uh, bless you this morning as, as we lift up praise from our hearts. Lord, that you would be glorified as well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's worship. Are we standing today? It's up to you, Pastor. Okay, we're good, right where you are. Walk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Sorry, folks.
a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am.
guide my stream when darkness surrounds my soul. I put my trust in you. Oh Lord, I need you. Oh Lord, I need you. Oh Lord, I need you.
That's our prayer this morning, Lord, that we'd surrender. It's the best place to be. And so, Lord, we just pray that this morning, Holy Spirit, you would teach us from your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Right on. So, last week we basically finished up Ephesians, and uh, we're going to move on to Philippians. But we decided, the Lord and I, decided that uh, that we'd go to a, a psalm, at least one psalm in between, you know, especially with the way things are going in the world. And, and we thought, well, well, we'll do that. We, we'll go to Psalm 77. So if you have your Bibles, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 77. Seek the Lord in the day of trouble. <clears throat> Psalm 77. You know, for a couple thousand years, the Psalms have been read and loved by believers because they provide the testimony of, of men and women in, in their life as believers, in, in their life of faith. And, and whether it's times of personal difficulties or, or struggles that we're going through or, or persecution or even in times of joy, there's nothing like the Psalms to line up with the, with the experiences of our heart. And earlier this week, I was reading Praying the Psalms. <clears throat> it's a, a G-man's journey down the Psalter Trail by Bob Blakesmith. And I read his take on Psalm 77, and I'll share it with you at the end. And unbeknownst to me, I didn't have a clue that Bob Blakesmith's sister would come to church at Simple Truth Church today with, with Bob's nephew, but uh, it's good to see him this morning. But anyway, because right now so many people are, are fi- facing the exact same problems that this uh, psalmist in 77 is facing. You know, in the day of trouble, seek the Lord. And, and follow along with me in Psalm 77. It's to the choir master, according to Jedithan. And it's a psalm of Asaph. Starting in verse 1. He says, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled I cannot speak. I consider the days of old and the years long ago. I said, 
Let me, re let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and, and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Verse 10, then I said, I will appeal to this, to the high years of the right hand of the Most High. I remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. And when the waters saw you, O oh God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea. Your path through the great waters. Yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hands of Moses and Aaron. See, as believers, as believers, we believe God is sovereign, that he's omnipotent, that he's omnipresent, that he does see the beginning of the parade. He sees the beginning of the parade, you know, when, when time started and he sees it to, to, the, to the end from creation until we're in glory. He sees it all and everything in between. And he touches our lives at every stage and at every aspect of what we're experiencing in our lives. And even the littlest things, he's, he's touching our lives. He, he knows about that. And because of that, we hear continual testimonies of, of, of people given of, of uh, you know, we pray for people. We hear these testimonies that the prayers were answers, answered and there's victories. There, victories are won in our lives. Victories are won in the lives of, of believers. Victories are won in lives of, of unbelievers that we pray for and they come to know Jesus. But all of us have experienced turning to God at some moment where there's a desperate need in our life and, and we're praying and asking God for help and, and finding nothing. It's like, wow, we find that the doors are apparently shut. There's no response. You know, there's no response. We're crying out to him, even to our most urgent, our most passionate plea from our hearts, the depths of our hearts, and there's no response. And we, when we don't get help, we, we long for, for what we long for and we, for what we desperately need. We, our hearts ask, why? Why? And then doubts flood our minds and we wonder, what's wrong? What's wrong? Are, are, are we really saved? Do we really have a relationship with God? You know, is, is there something wrong with me? Is there, is there something wrong with God? It, it's likely that we're going through this experience even today. When we've been crying to God for help... And then there's no help given. And this is the problem that is faced in the, in the, that the psalmist is faced here in, in the 77th Psalm. This psalm was written in order to, to help people with this kind of problem. And so the psalm relates the story of a man who has experienced a, a seemingly unresponsiveness of God in his prayers. And it drove him almost to the point of despair. And then... He saw what was wrong, he, he corrects his way of thinking, and then he comes to a place of trust, he comes to a place of peace, he, he comes to a place of, of strength again. And from desperation to peace, desperation to peace, that's the story of, of the 77th Psalm. And probably all of us have experienced this, you know, we're being so tired, we're, we're just emotionally distraught that, that we can't respond to a teaching, you know, you you come to church and you're that way and a teaching's set out and you, you can't even respond to it. You know, someone tries to help us by pointing out some truth that, that we know and we know what they're saying is, is, is true, but it doesn't click. It doesn't do anything for us. You know, when somebody's real helpful to us and they said, come up and say, well, did you pray about it? Have you been reading the Bible? 
and you just think, yeah. You know, at times like that when we're buffeted and beaten by the storms of life, you know, many, many times we turn to the Psalms and, and read the experiences of men and women that, that God, you know, gave them the strength or, or, or like we're going to see in this Psalm that they've gone through exactly the same struggles and the same pressures that we go through. The Apostle Paul, he puts it this way in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He says, no temptation or, or trial, that's the same word in the Greek here. It's no temptation or trial has, has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted or, or, or tried beyond your ability. But with that temptation or trial, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Even that point right there that Paul makes is helpful. Even that point when you read that and you think, okay, well, there's nothing new under the sun. And, and so people have gone through what I've gone through or are going through and, they, and they've survived it. And so that point right there helps. And that's why the Psalms have been such a tremendous blessing in times of, of really serious emotional problems and distress. Psalm 77 rings a bell with us, and, 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 and we have felt like this. We have felt like this in verses 1 and 2. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. So we can, we can sense the desperation about that. We can sense that because, because we've lived that, right? And here's a man who's faced with a deep and, and serious problem. It's, it is coming from his guts, right? You know, and, and we aren't ever told specifically in this psalm or anywhere else what the trouble is, but the effect of it's very clear. You know, perhaps it's some deep disappointment. You know, all of us experience that from time to time. Sometimes, you know, we had our heart set on something, and then through the course of events, it doesn't work out the way we thought it was going to work out. And so it, it falls through. We're absolutely crushed. And then he comes to God in his distress. This guy, he comes to him in, in, in that distress. and it will, Or maybe it's a sorrow that, that has come in his life because somebody passed away, and we've experienced that. Or losing a friend. Or something that utterly crushed his heart to sorrow possibly he's projecting fear you know and that and that happens and that's dangerous where we project fear and, and it seems that it's visible on the horizon in his life and it looks unavoidable I you know I, I've never been uh, had a disease that was incurable but I could see where that could come into play here where you're projecting you're projecting and and, and uh and, and you can see things coming that are obviously unavoidable, but you don't know how God's going to work things out and how that could make you stay awake at night. Or perhaps it's some defiling experience that, that he has gone through, something that he walked into without realizing what he was doing, and he found himself caught up in things that later he was totally ashamed of himself or, or afterwards. It's like, how did that happen? And all these experiences can produce this kind of reaction, and the psalmist only refers to it as, in verse 2, the day of my trouble. It's the day of my trouble. And so we can see how it hits him as he cries to God again and again. It's, he repeats himself. And, and here is a man who is pouring out his heart in prayer. He's pleading with God. He's crying out for help. He's stretching out his hand, pleading with God. Please, God. And if we've experienced this, we can relate to exactly how he feels. There's... There's this involuntary sense of pleading with God, of, of praying, of, of crying out to him, of, of asking him for help. You, and you can think about, uh, sorry, you can think about Paul the Apostle in, in uh, Romans 8, you know, where, where he's talking about how he's, it's, he's groaning. He, he doesn't even know what to say. And his spirit groans within him and the Holy Spirit basically translates because the Holy Spirit knows. So the psalmist seeks comfort for his soul. And like many of us have done, he says to himself, hey, you know what, I can't get carried away like this. I can't do this. I can't be thinking about this. I, I, you know, look how 
distressed I am, how full of anxiety I am, how, how upset I am. Look how, uh, it, you know, and it's only going to make it worse this way. What, I can't do this. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to forget about it for a while. I'm just going to go hoping that it goes away. I'm going to get busy and go do something else, and it's going to go. But he says in verse, C, verse uh, 2C, he says, my soul refuses to be comforted. It refuses to be comforted. The problem, whatever it is, it's haunting him. You know, it, it, there's nothing that can take his mind off of it. Every time he tries to do something else, his mind's hijacked with what's going on in his mind, and, and it returns again to this very unpleasant problem that's twisted him up, that eats him alive, that haunts him, that tortures him, and it won't let him go. Then the problem even gets worse in verses 3 and 4. He says, when I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my, my spirit faints. He says, you hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. So it increases, it increases his distress, right? And he cries out all the more. He tries to think about God, but it says his spirit faints. His spirit's fainting within him, and he feels himself growing weak, almost despairing. I mean, how many times have you laid awake and you think, no, I'm not even going to go there. I can't think about it. I'm not going to think about it. And then you think, okay, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and then it's 5 o'clock in the morning, and then it's time to get up. I can, I can picture this guy. He tries to sleep, but his eyelids refuse to close. And all night long, he talks, tosses and turns his restless anguish, sleeplessness. Finally, he's absolutely speechless. And he can't even describe his problem to somebody else. And that's an honest description of, of a man in trouble. And that's a beautiful thing about the Word of God. That is a beautiful thing about the Word of God. It never glosses over human problems. You know, it never treats them as, as writers of our day often do. The Scriptures plunge right in. They, it's like a knife, right? And surgical, it plunges right into the depths, cuts right into the depths, right into the heart of the circumstances. Dissects it. So here's the, the psalmist. Holding back nothing, describing exactly how he feels. And, and some, are, some of us are saying, well, that's my experience. I've experienced that exact same thing. It's exactly. That's, that's just what I've been going through. And so we look at this man's experience. He's obviously a believer in God. Okay, he, he, is, he has brought his trouble to the Lord. He brought it to the Lord, delayed at his feet. He realizes there's, there is help in God, and, and that's where he's come. That's why he's come there. And he's a godly person. And you know, you think about it, this is true about all the Psalms. All the Psalms, they're godly people. They represent the struggles and problems of godly people. That's what they, excuse me, represent. So we find that even in the New Testament, right? Paul the Apostle speaks of being pressed upon every side and the problems that he despaired, that they were so great that he despaired even his life. 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 9. We also read about that in the Garden of Gethsemane as well with Jesus. You know, and it's not wrong to be faced with these kind of problems. See, here's a godly man, yet he's confronted with terrible circumstances in, a life, in his life, and it makes him cry out to God. And he's not a rookie, right? He's not a new Christian or a new believer. He's, he's, he's not a beginner in the faith, and, and he believes in God. He's not an immature believer. It seems that he's well acquainted with the scriptures, right? He, he knows the history. He's told us some history here about God's people. And he's obviously been instructed in certain methods to try when he's seeking help from God. He mentions two of them here, prayer and meditation. And he knows that it's Im important to bring his problem to God. And he knows the way to approach him, and he's sincerely He's sincerely uh, attempting to do these very things. Yet the second factor for our consideration is evident that he's confronted here with, with two problems. He's got two problems, not just one. First, the distressing circumstances that have, have brought him to God, right? Re and those are reflected in verses 1 and 2. But in, in verses 3 and 4, there's a second kind of problem that grows out of the first and, and there's that apparent failure of God to respond to his plea for help. And so that compounds the problem. That makes it worse. Of the two problems, that's the greatest problem. 
That's the one where he says in verse 3, I think of God and I moan. It only makes him feel worse. Why doesn't God do something? If God was here, this wouldn't be happening to me. This is a cry that comes welling up out of the depths of his anguish. It's like, you have got to be kidding me. In verse 3, when I remember God, I moan. And he's like, why doesn't God help me? When I meditate, my spirit faints. So it's bad enough that he endures the circumstances that he has to go through. But what really troubles this man is that he's facing the possible ruin of his faith. You know, he, he sees that there's a possibility of him not only losing this battle, but of losing every battle. And so what is, what's really troubling is, is down, down deep is that if, if, if his prayer doesn't work, then God isn't real. That's troubling that if, if God is not real, then his faith is delusion. That his faith isn't real. That life's a nightmare of hopelessness. And this man is but a helpless victim of forces that are totally out of his control. And he's just along for the ride. He doesn't know where he's going and who he's going with. If God's not answering his prayers. And that is his major problem. That is what's really bothering this guy. And so <clears throat> this is what distresses us. A lot of this. It's not so much the fact that we, we go through difficult times. I mean because we know. That's one of the promises in the Bible, right? We've said that before, that we don't care. Care for that in this life you shall have tribulation, okay? So it's not so much the fact that we, that we go through difficult times and tribulation and pressing circumstances, but what gets us to the moments like this is when we pray and ask God for help and nothing seems to happen. It's like, wow. You know, the quiet, the quiet is deafening. There's no, it, there's no response. We have to struggle with, have we been kidding ourselves all along? You know, I cry out to God, is, is, is faith a delusion or is, is God not real? And that's where the, he's struggling as well. Anxiety, and then anxiety, distress, things that are going on in our life like that opens up the door to temptation. Every time we enter a period of struggle or pressure or, or unhappy circumstances, we're exposed to severe and pressing temptation to doubt. Very tempted, very tempted to doubt. And then the enemy, like we learned in Ephesians 6, tries to get a foothold in there. If he could get a little bit of doubt going on, then he starts to get a foothold. And so we, we have a temptation to disbelieve. And it seems to, co uh, to come at us, it's so logical, right? That's the experience this man had. He's tried prayer and it didn't seem to work. God's unresponsive. Nothing inside himself lifts his, the burden of his heart. He can't fix it. He decides to try something else, something that very likely was suggested to him by someone who's well-meaning. Again, he decides, I'm going to meditate. I'm going to think about God. I'm going to think, I'm going to think through my problem. In verses 5 and 6, back in our text, she says, I consider the days of old, the, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. So, here, again, he's looking for answers. He goes back over the past. He's thinking about how God's been good to him in the past. And, and he meditates. He remembers years long ago. He remembers past blessing. He's remembering the times that he found God's favor. He remembers how God has given him a song, gave him a song in his heart. And, and though the circumstances were distressing, he had been kept strong at that, with that inner song. And when I was, when I was thinking about that, I was thinking about, uh, give me Jesus. What's the result of that kind of approach? And, and back in our text, verses 7 through 9, he says, will the Lord spurn forever? That's what he's thinking about when he's, when he's meditating. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased or his promises at the end at an end for all time has God forgotten to be gracious has he in anger shut up his compassion see that seems logical that's you know he's he's reasoning in his mind it seems logical if God blessed in the past why doesn't he bless now if he's been faithful in the past why come he isn't faithful now why do I seem so or feel so abandoned 
And, and these are questions that are pressing upon him. And then the conclusion comes in verse 10. And then I said, I will appeal to this. I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. So here, here's a man who's really, he's really trying to be honest here. And he says, hey, you know what, I tried to figure out my situation. I've worked it over. I've, I've prayed about it all night long. In the past, I know that God has given me help, but no help has come now. God's made my heart to sing in the past. He's given me joy. He's given me peace in the past. But, but it's empty, barren, and joyless right now. So why is this? He says, I thought about it. I searched my own life. I've searched my own heart. And these questions have come, have come to me, and I can't answer them. I can't figure it out. And so my findings must be, hey, I, I misjudged God. I thought that God never changed, but that he would always respond to me every time, each and every time that I cried out to him, but he hasn't. And because of that, I'm driven to the irresistible conclusion that God has changed, that he has changed, that, that he is like a man, that, that you can't count on him. And so this man's facing the possibility of losing his faith. He says, my faith is, is, is fainting. And he sees the, the terrible tragedy of it. And so this is, this is he has once, he's once counted on all this, and this has always comforted him in the past. It strengthened him, and, and it gave him character. It gave him power among men in the past. Now it seems like, like it's nothing, it's, but crumbling his crumbling foundation around him, and it's disappearing fast. And soon he's... He's going to lose everything that he held on to in the past. And that is, again, what he said is, my, this is my day of trouble. And that's his present distress. That's the hidden problem right there, you guys, of, of many us, of us. That's the hidden problem right there. You know, we, hey, I just don't know what to do. I've tried prayer. I don't know what to do. I've tried reading my Bible. I've tried to think about things, but nothing seems to help. It just doesn't seem to help. And I don't know what to do. What's wrong with me? And then again, the enemy steps in and says, you're not even saved. You don't even have a relationship with God. In fact, did God really say that? So and there, therein lies right there the reason why this psalm was written. Right there. This man found what was wrong. And he, and he found it very quickly and he began to change. And he worked his way through it on, on a different approach. And, and it, soon it, brought, it soon brought him out to a place where he had peace. Brought him to a place where he had trust. You know, many, many have worked their way through, through the things that we go through. We work through those because, because we want to live a life of faith. And so we're able to work through those things. That is one of the great things that we can learn from the, from the psalm right at the very beginning. The reason why this is true is declared by the prophet Isaiah. It's declared a lot of places in the Bible, but the, the prophet Isaiah declares it uh, most clearly. Isaiah reveals that God says in Isaiah 55, 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. You know, I've thought about that when I'm doing memorial services. And you, and you think about Martha running out and meeting Jesus after her brother Lazarus died. She runs out there and meets him, and she, and, and she says, you know, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. I mean, how many times have I thought that? You know, Jesus, if you would have been here, this wouldn't have happened. But then I think to this, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways. God's perfect. And so next week, we're going to hold off on the conclusion on this. But, and we'll go over that next week, the, the, the next 10 verses. But we're going to conclude today but by what Blacksmith said. And, 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 and uh, Bob Blacksmith, he wrote this, praying the Psalms. He's a former FBI sniper. I like to throw that in. I worked with him at the sheriff's office. I like to hear, you know, what a guy, because he's brilliant, so, so I like to hear what a guy says with that kind of background, what he says about the Psalms, because he's, he's an investigator. He's a trained investigator, so he investigated this. This is what he says. 
This is in praying the Psalms. You can get it on Amazon. It says, how do you pray? Of course, there are many methods, and the proper quote-unquote way to, is often determined by the situation. In this psalm, we see a person who is at wit's end, despondent and in deep distress. What does he do? He prays. Not some inaudible mental prayer, but ardently passionate and heartfelt cries rising up to the Lord. And then... As if to emphasize it, he says it twice. Our psalmist pleading turned to languishing laments of reflective memories, giving weight to his eternal arguments. Internal arguments. It is only then he begins to meditate on the greatness of God and all the marvelous deeds he has performed. The Lord is well aware of the inner conflicts we struggle with, so there's no need to mull over them with murmurings or whispered words. Cry out to the Lord and share with him the deepest longings of your heart. He is always there to hear us. And then he has a prayer. And and we're going to close in communion this morning. And I don't know if everybody got their... Little communion cups. We're going to have communion like we're in jail this morning, you know. <laughs> and if you lift the lid on the little communion cup, it's got the little cracker in there. I know it's not like you guys are used to where somebody brings in fresh bread. But it'll work. And so you open up that top and then the bottom is the, the juice. I guess you need a knife to open it. <laughs> or directions. I guess I could have done this beforehand and made it look easy. Wow. Yeah, it's childproof. And I don't want to just chew the aluminum foil because that would hurt my teeth. Okay, there it is. Got it. I just did it from the backwards. All right. So what I want to do is we're going to close in the prayer that Bob Blakesmith wrote. This is his prayer after he went over that synopsis of the psalm. And this is his prayer. And we'll partake at the, at the end. Let's pray. Oh God, I cry out to you with a troubled voice and you hear me. When the travailing trials of life linger from day into, into the, uh, night, I seek your face for guidance. For unless you rescue me, my soul will never know solace. When I think of you, O oh Lord, and how much I depend on your grace, it can overwhelm both soul and spirit. With sleepless eyes and speechless voice, I realize my dire dilemma. I'm lost without you. When the doubts of despair creep like, creep like creatures in the night, I will recall my song to you, and my heart will meditate on your goodness and thereby dis- depose distrust. Away with any questions about your acceptance, loving kindness, gracious compassion, or promises. Yes, I will meditate on your mighty deeds and wondrous works, for for you have redeemed your people. Water, wind, earth, fire reside in the palm of your hand. Without delay, they rapidly respond to your commands. And while no one can trace your footsteps, you lead your people in love. If we will only listen, obey, and follow. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that Jesus is our answer, that Jesus is is our peace, that Jesus is our comfort. And, Lord, as as we take these communion elements and, and we think about him, we do this in remembrance of him and the fact that, that we realize that we're just sinners For we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we recognize that Jesus is who he is. And he's the king of kings and lord of lords. That he died on the cross for us. And he rose from the dead. And he's alive today. And so we repent. 
turn from our sins, ask you to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And Lord, we receive that free gift of eternal life and we thank you. Let's partake. And Lord, I pray as, as, uh, as we leave here today, we'll meditate on these things. I pray that you be blessed as we close in, in a song. In Jesus' name, amen. Got a text that the kids get to go home. Yeah. Hey. Wow. So, hey, thanks for being here today, whether here or on live on Facebook. Glad to, that we're all here. And, but when you leave here today and you, with that taste of styrofoam and, uh, 
and juice in your mouth. And remember, his grace is enough. His grace is enough. So if you need prayer, Pastor David's up here. He's got anointing oil. And uh, you can come up here and you can get prayer. God bless you guys. Have a great week. If you need anything, call us, text us. And um, looking forward to the conclusion of this next week. So uh, you can go ahead and read ahead because it gets good. Anyway, God bless you guys.